lost loved ones. There's stories, and many of you I know are related um, to those families. Some of you even share the names here, but even um, Albert, who was one of the main carpenters when this building was built, and when we, when we took out, for those of you who are relatively new to our church, there used to be permanent um, four, three-foot walls back here. They were modesty panels. All churches used to have them. And when we decided to take those out, we had a terrible time taking them out. And Brother Harvey, we told him what we were doing. And he's well, if Albert Ward put that in there, you'll have a hard time getting it. And he was right. Um, Albert Ward had it built solid and glued down. And we could not tear one board from another. They actually... Um, the boards were glued and nailed to the particle board, and the particle board finally gave way. So we got it out. Um, so he did, he did a great job in, in what he did. So all of these, um, that as we get older, all these life experiences, they, they ought to. I think what God intended with all of this is make us realize how much we are in his hand and how much we do need his grace and how much we must trust him and his wisdom and his guidance because for many of the things that we face, there are no answers. Included in that list that we gave you this today of families who were suffering loss, some of them um, had lived many, many years, but there was a young girl mentioned there. Um, I don't think she'd quite even reached her teenage years that had passed from cancer. And so we have to trust God. And this morning, I'm glad that I can. I'm glad that I can. And I guess if there is a, a blessing in all of this as we get older, is that through each of these experiences we go through, the Lord reassures us that He really is there and He really does guide us. We read about it in the Bible and we talk about it and we hear it in Sunday school class and the preacher rattles about it every Sunday. But when you walk through the valley with God yourself, What's the old saying that a man with an argument can't stand against a man with an experience? And it doesn't matter what the world says or what others may say, when you've walked with God and when God's ministered to you in the darkest and lowest points of your life, there's nothing that can take that away. And how good it is to know that He's not just a God who comes down on this, this first Sunday of our second winter, apparently, and, and sees us all together here but he's a God who knows everything about each one of us individually. And he knows what's coming and he knows what's past and he knows how to take care of us if we'll trust him. And I'm glad I can do that here this morning. This morning is one of those Sundays that we will every once in a while step outside of our usual preaching and we hope to have for you very soon a couple of other um, series that we've, we've got in the, in the works. But we'll take some time and talk about what's posted on our envelope. Remember, this envelope is it's, it's an offering envelope, obviously, but it's really not an offering envelope. It's a business envelope, a small one, and it's larger than the usual offering envelope. And we did it on purpose because three reasons. One, you can put more stuff in it. We could get more printed on it, and then it was cheaper. See, we're, we're building walls, and we're doing all these things here. But the idea of, of the envelope and putting those seven things on there is to remind us constantly that we are building walls. And every day we need to be reminded of those things that are important. If you don't make plans and if you don't do things intentionally, time will push through and you'll wind up with things that you really wanted to get done that were really important, but because they weren't noisy enough or because they were in your face, they, they didn't get finished. And you got the lawn mowed and you got the flowers watered and you got the dirty clothes finally off the floor because your wife has been screaming at you. You got all those things done, but the really important things, and it's important to do what your wife tells you, all right? Get those dirty clothes off the floor. I didn't want the ladies all carrying signs the next Sunday that the preacher said they weren't important. But the really important things are the times that we spend sometimes with our own family just sitting and talking with each other, the plans that we make, the intention of praying, reading our Bible, ministering to young people. So I want to talk about that every once in a while, and we're going to do that here this morning. 
It's the first Sunday after Easter. And if you can flip back in your mind and try to visualize it as those first Christians would have experienced it. You know, they had gone from being very fearful after Jesus' crucifixion. They had no idea what was about to happen to them. They, they knew he had told them about coming again and, and being back, and, but many of them didn't quite grasp the fullness, if any of them did, of exactly what Jesus meant in all of the things he said leading up to his resurrection. And that's why, even though they may have heard the words, they didn't piece it all together. And so they were scattered and some were hiding, and it was the ladies who went first to the tomb on that early morning to make sure that they could properly take care of his body because if you remember they hurried and took him down from the cross because the Sabbath was approaching and once the Sabbath came they weren't allowed to touch dead bodies they'd be declared unclean and so they hurriedly wrapped him in these cloths and put him in this borrowed tomb so now the Sabbath is over and the ladies are coming to do all that they can to properly make sure his body is taken care of as it should. And so they're the ones that stumble in on this resurrection. And then the noise is, is scattered about and they hear about all the things that, that Jesus had done and now he's alive and the news travels to each one. Jesus suddenly appears. It's not like he had been before where he had been with them or was predictable. They knew that they couldn't find Jesus in their crowd. He could be found down in the garden early in the morning in prayer. He had a habit of getting up before it was day and going and praying. He would show up on the seashore and hung around their little communities. They knew where they could find him when he was here before his crucifixion. But now, now he would just show up. Some of them would be standing in a room or sitting and talking and he'd be there. No knock on the door. No hole in the wall, just there he is. They discussed it among themselves. And Thomas, remember, he said, I'll not believe it until I put my hands where those nails had been and I see it for myself. And so about a week or so later, and along about this time, would have been the time that some of those men and women, for the first time, were actually seeing the resurrected Lord. What had been fear in their hearts and what had pushed them to hide, now they had a renewed boldness because this one that they had watched die was now alive. And so here they stood and here they sat in their rooms and walking down the road and, and he would show up and be there and then they wouldn't see him for a while and then he would come back. But somewhere along about now, he began to meet with them because the book of Acts tells us that for 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus spent time with his apostles and his disciples, teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We don't know what they are. I would love to have tape recordings of those meetings. But I can imagine that what Jesus was telling them was, you remember when I told you all this stuff before my crucifixion? When I told you about how repentance and remission of sin would be preached in my name beginning at Jerusalem, you remember all of that? Well, here's how it works. And so for 40 days after his resurrection, he talked to them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He, he was finishing building that wall that he had started. It was no longer just abstract parables, but now for 40 days it was face-to-face -face teaching and instruction on this is about the kingdom of God. This is what I meant. This is how it's done. This is what you do. And so when he led them out at the end of that 40th day, or in the, around about that period of that time, when he led them out to the Mount of Olives, and he on top of that hill told them, you go to all the world and you preach the gospel. All that I've told you these last 40 days and all that I lived those three and a half years before, you take it now to the world and you preach it and you teach it and you baptize and you touch people's lives. And then he went up into heaven. And then he, the angel came and asked them, why are you standing here staring? He told you what to do. He told you to go to Jerusalem. And so they went to Jerusalem and for the next 10 days or so, waited for his spirit to come on the day of Pentecost. 
that few days after the resurrection, it had to be a time of excitement, but also a time of, of uncertainty. They were facing a world that was wonderfully, gloriously inviting to them when they viewed it through the eyes of what Jesus had taught them. But when they stopped and looked around, they realized there were friends and family and long traditionally held religious folks that were not going to be happy with what they were trying to do. And so this world that offered a lot of promise also offered a lot of pushback. And, and they realized quickly as they began to preach this message after Acts chapter 2's experience of the Holy Ghost, they realized that not everybody is, is going to lay down and, and joyfully accept all that I bring them, but there are going to be people who will get in my face and folks who will try to kill us and people that will put us in jail. And I imagine what they experienced in those days is very much the same feeling that you and I have on this Sunday morning. There's the glorious promise of God's power and spirit inside of our hearts. There's the joy of living a life where your sins have been forgiven and you feel the cleanness. I'm not talking about just I hope that God hears me and by faith I accept that my sins are gone. But I'm talking about a real clean heart where you feel the washing of that blood of Jesus Christ over your soul and spirit, where you know they're gone and where your heart reflects that knowledge and its joy and its peace. And so we come on this Sunday and we feel that and we love it and, and we know the power of God that is real and is strong and the whole world needs to know it. But then there's the questions in our hearts that will they accept it? There's things in the Bible I can't explain, so how am I going to convince them? When I talk to them about how good God is, they point out that young children die and get abused. And So what do I say? And when I talk about God's goodness and grace and how God has power to heal and I pray for them and nothing happens, y'all with me this morning? Sometimes this power of God that's alive in our hearts clashes with this real world that we live in. And we find ourselves sometimes like who we've called Doubting Thomas, who says, until I touch him, I really, I really won't believe it for myself because I know all that happened and I know that he died and I know the horrible death and I saw the tomb. But when Thomas met Jesus and had that personal connection with him, and when the Lord personally looked him in the eye and called him by name and Thomas reached out and touched him, he said, my Lord and my God. You and I have been touched by the power of God. And folks, I know that sometimes there are things in this world that there are no explanations that we humans can come up with. There are sometimes things that would fly in the face of our faith that make us question, does God really care? Is he really there? Is everything I thought and believed, does it really matter and does it really work? I assure you this morning that the same God who is talking to your heart and touching you this morning is the one that we read about in these pages because we read the exact same things expressed in the lives of those who walked up and down this earth with him in person when he was here. We read about it in the discussions in the church where the Apostle Paul says there are going to be all kinds of different theories and doctrines rise up from among you because some men are going to get confused and some men are going to rely more on their knowledge and wisdom and some are going to rely more on the respected teachers and instructors that they've got their confidence in. And so there's going to be all kinds of versions of everything tossed in there. But he said, don't worry about that. You cling to what has been preached to you and even if an angel comes and preaches a message other than what we've delivered unto you, don't believe it, don't buy into it because God is at work in your lives. And so this morning we come back to build that wall. Not because we have it all together and know everything that needs to be known about human life because the older I get, the more I realize you never get it. This is a life of faith. This is a life of trust. And the only way you live out that life of trust is by taking what the Word says and adapting your life to fit it. All day long we can talk about how much faith we have in the Word of God, but if we don't do what it says, if we don't read to find out what it says, if, if it really has no place in our lives, then folks, we don't have faith in it. 
And so while I stand here this morning and tell you we've got to have absolutely all of our confidence and faith in the Word of God, I also tell you there will be those moments and times in life where there are no explanations to what we experience, and we simply trust God and move forward. There'll be things like the Apostle Paul where you'll say, Lord, please remove this from me. And God's answer is going to be, my grace is sufficient. And so for the rest of your life, you'll walk with that struggle, whatever it was. And you'll watch other people get their healing and you'll watch other people delivered. And you'll limp home. And the Lord reminds you, my grace is sufficient. Somehow in the midst of all of this, inside of our hearts... We've got to come to the conclusion that God is real and he's proven himself to us. And his word has never led us astray and it will never lead us astray in the future if we put our confidence in it. And so today I encourage you, we've come to build walls. We've come to build walls. It's not original with me. Matter of fact, I saw it pop up again on somebody else's sermon notes just a couple of days ago on Facebook. But the statement is we, we lock our doors and build our walls not because we hate what's outside, but because we love what's inside. And today we stand here united in the cause that God has brought us together for. We are united not just because it's the name of our church, and we're united not just because we're scared of what would happen perhaps if we didn't have fellowship together and people that that are stronger than us at times when, when our faith is weak. We're, we're united not just because this has been our family tradition, but we're united because the Lord has called us to live His Word and to walk His way. United not just to reap the benefits of God's blessing, and there are many of them. Feeling His presence here today, the joy of family. Folks, if we live our lives according to this book, if we will commit our hearts and our lives to the ways that are taught there, we'd have a whole lot less trouble in our lives. We'd have joy and peace. There'd be no jealousy or envy. There'd be love and compassion. We wouldn't have to lock our doors at night or during the day. We could give freely and receive freely. and Wives would love their husbands and trust them, and husbands would be trustworthy and love and respect their wives if we were all walking in the Word of God. I find no reason to ignore the Word. I find no reason to push for something better or different because as I've concluded my little survey of the world and its options, I find none that offers something better than the Word of God. Amen. And so I don't come tonight or this morning just because of God's blessings that are heaped upon us. And I don't stand united hoping that God's goodness is going to flow into my life but we stand united knowing that God has put us on this earth to be his voice to the world. In the midst of a dark world to shine the light of grace and godliness and kindness and peace. In the midst of a world that's filled with all kinds of noise and philosophies and different ideas. To stand and say, I don't know and understand everything about God. But I do know that he reached down and saved me. And I do know that when the Bible says he will forgive, he will forgive. And I do know when the Bible says that he brings joy and that with, with abundance into our lives, I can testify that that happens. And so I will take the things of the word that I don't understand on faith because the things I do know and can experience, God has proven to be accurate and 100% correct in my soul. As Job declared, he's done nothing but good in my life, and I cannot stand here today, even if I had a trial or test that I wanted to share with you this morning, I would have to tell you that God is good. God is good. And so today, I remind you that we don't come and stand united just so that we can get more good stuff from God, but we come united, that as a united group, we can speak with one voice to this world that drastically and desperately needs a revival and a change in their direction in their hearts. I know I repeat a lot of things. You're going to hear a lot of things repeated over and over. But according to Brene Brown, who is a, a popular researcher who studied fear and other things, mainly with women but also with men, says that in the midst of this culture that offers the most promise that's ever been extended to men and women 
we wind up being the most addicted and the most fearful. Our world needs more than just an opportunity. Human beings need more than just options. They need something that's strong in their life. They need something that's a strong foundation they can build upon. And they need something that they care enough about and that's important enough to even die for. Today we stand united because there's a cause that's bigger than us. There is a cause to take the gospel to the world. There's a cause, and it's called your next door neighbor. There's a cause, and it's called the little children who are dropped off at school every day, whose parents live in a drug stupor, and those kids have no idea what's going to happen when they get home. That's why we stand united. That's why we build walls. That's why we're talking about giving and praying and reading and fasting and discipling and inviting and encouraging, because it's not just about more stuff for us to play with. It's not just about more money in our pocket. It's not about nicer suit, fancier clothes, bigger houses. It's not about awards and plaques and recognition, but it's about individual lives that are tormented every day that you and I can make a difference in if we would live a united life, build a strong wall that's a shelter from the darkness of the world and a comfort and a place of hope for those who are lost and in darkness. So we stand united this morning. If you'll let me take just a moment and run through these things and tell you again why they're important. All we're asking you to do is pray one hour a week. That's not a huge amount of time. And again, from 5.30 till about 5.45, 5.50, we're praying in the children's sanctuary. So you get almost half of it on that Sunday evening. But if you don't intentionally stop and take some time to pray, your day's going to get by, there's too much going on, and the only prayer you're going to pray is if somebody pulls out in front of you or one of your children won't answer when you call their cell phone for the 15th time. Those are the only times that you'll utter a prayer because there's too much going on in your world. There's too much time that's demanded of us. And so you carry that little envelope in your pocket. And it gets in your way. I hate carrying these things. It gets in your way. Every time you move and turn around, it's, it's rubbing against something or you reach in there and pull something else out and, and it's in the way. But every time I pick it up, it reminds me that little box for that praying an hour is still, it's still unchecked. It's still unchecked. I can't check it till my hour's up. Folks, we need to pray. This is a spiritual battle. If you're trying to win this based on thinking it through, you'll never get to the end of it. If you're trying to weigh it out from a philosophical position, you'll be thinking it 125 years from now because you'll never get it thought through. About the time you think you've got your head around it, there's another angle of it. Even the memory verse we're going to pop up today it talks about us being baptized. And it says that Jesus was risen and that when you and I are baptized, we are risen by the glory of God. Do you know that? Do you have that verse back there, John? Can you pull that up? I know I, I told you later, but this is the verse for the week. That's not it. There it is. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the... Do you know what the glory of the Father is? He, that's what raised Jesus up. We beheld his glory, the disciples said. How can the gospel not be rather glorious... The Apostle Paul talks about the glory of the Lord. That's why 
brothers and sisters, you can't come to church and feel the power of the Holy Ghost and there not be some gloriness that runs up and down your spine or, or something that moves in you. There's an emotional response because God's not just dealing with us simply in a cold, calculated manner, but He's letting the glory and power of His Spirit move in us just as the glory of God hovered over the tabernacle in the Old Testament, just as it filled it on certain occasions. It's that same glorious power of God that's working in our hearts and lives. We've got to pray. This is a spiritual battle. <clears throat> and I encourage you, we'll never understand and come to grips with all of this just with our carnal methods. Pray. We've got to pray. Read the Bible. We're giving you one verse a week. These verses all have a theme, but the themes all, you don't get the same theme every week. But there's the importance of the Word of God, the importance of baptism, the Holy Ghost, repentance, the importance of prayer, the importance of living a holy life. All of this is going to be thrown throughout these 52 verses that we'll be memorizing. Obviously, this one is telling us about baptism. It's important that we're baptized. And this is from the book of Romans where Paul's sharing with them, this is what you have experienced when you were baptized in Jesus' name, this is, how, this is how God works. And just as he raised Jesus up, that same glory should also be in us and help us walk in the newness of life. So we're praying and we're reading the Bible. We're memorizing 52 verses of Scripture. And you need to be reading some more, you know. If, if you have a hard time, just read, read a book of Proverbs or a chapter in Proverbs. Read a chapter in the book of Acts, a chapter in, in the Gospels. Just pick out one, and, and those will help you get started. But the Word of God is a spiritual book. Again, you won't grasp it just trying to figure it out or read it in just scientific measures or looking at it as a dictionary that has, has all kinds of answers that we go to when we need them or an encyclopedia that has knowledge that we can, can come back and use as a resource. It's a spiritual book. It's God revealing himself to man. And you've got to have the spirit involved when you read it. We're building walls because this world's philosophy has failed. This world's ideas and ideals have crumbled. It's not working, folks. It's not working. There's something that will, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've got to build some strong walls for our families, for ourselves, for our church, for our community, so that there's a place where they can come, a place where they can go, and those who wander away, they need a place to come back to. We've got to build the walls in our lives so that it's, it's good and it's safe for them. Fasting, denying ourselves, asking you to fast one day a week. We're kind of using eat, if you'll eat supper on Tuesday night and then not eat again till before you come to church on Wednesday. That lets us have our children have their birth, their parties, whatever they do back there and eat and, and still get our fasting in. But if that day doesn't work for you, if you can't do a whole day, just pick a time and sometime in the week, Deny yourself. We've got to deny ourselves. And it's not just about denying ourselves, but it's realizing how blessed and how good we are. How good we are. How good God has been to us. There's a difference there, right? How good God has been to us. And it's, as the prophet Isaiah said, it's about sharing our food with others. When you skip a meal... You might take some fried chicken to a neighbor. It's about sharing. It's not just about, it's not just about the, the coldness of self-denial, but it's about the realization that everything comes from God and blessing others. So we pray and we read and we fast. And those are all spiritual things. And guess what? The next one's spiritual as well. Giving. When God sent Moses to get the Israelites out of Egypt. They had been slaves for the better part of 430 years. Slaves. Their diet, some wild onions. They talk about the garlic and wild onions that they would get. Their load was increased so that they could not 
have time or energy to rise up and, and plan or plot a revolt against the, the Pharaoh. So they were heavily laden, building, making bricks, working hard as slaves. And God sent Moses to get them out of there. And he did. And that verse that they tried to get us to read a while ago, we're going to read it here now. It says united. In Exodus chapter 3, in verse 21, the Lord saying to Moses, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, ye shall not go empty. 430 years as slaves. But the Lord told Moses, When you go, you're not going to go empty. And he had them go to all of the neighbors and borrow from them jewelry. And so the neighbors loaned them all of this jewelry. And the Israelites borrowed it, took it. And when they left in the middle of the, the night after they had had this, it was actually early morning, but after the Passover time, and they left, they had all this jewelry they took with them. Now, in the midst of their traveling the next several years, they built a tabernacle, they built a golden calf, and they furnished everything with gold and silver and brass and things that you and I could never get enough together. And they did it in such an overwhelming fashion that Moses finally told them, don't bring any more offerings. Don't bring any more. When God said, you won't go out empty, he meant what he said. Brothers and sisters, we sit here today, the Lord's brought us out of sin. But I don't think there's anybody in this room that will lift their hand and say, I, I have less than I had before. Oh, I may not make as much money. There's money in bootleg and booze, and there's money in cheating people. And sometimes there are folks who work 80 hours a week and make a whole lot of money but at some point realize that I'm not getting anywhere by doing that. And so, yeah, yeah, there may have been a time where you had more money. But folks, with your peace of mind and with the blessing of God and with the food that we eat and the way that God has blessed us, the Lord has never sent us out empty. He has blessed our lives and he has touched us just as he did these folks. And he's promised to keep us and he's promised to guide us. And just as the, as the prophet declared, I've, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. So God can speak that to our hearts. God has blessed us. He's given us our, our hearts, our lives, our families, our children, and he's filled us with many good things. God has not sent us out empty. And then when the Lord a few chapters later was reminding the Israelites of bringing, to bring their gifts. He told them in chapter 23, he said, Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month, Abib, for in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. The Lord said, Look, I brought you out of Egypt, and I made sure you did not come out empty. Now, when I come to meet with you, and when we come together, you don't come empty. Because it's God that's provided everything that you have. If you want to read a little bit more about it, you read it in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 10 through 18, where the Lord said even the, the ability to gather wealth and to create wealth comes from God. The land, I'll bless it so that your cows will eat grass and you'll have plenty to eat. The Lord made sure that his people had plenty. And I'm telling you here this morning, the more that we receive, the more we need to give to God. And building walls is not just about us giving money so the church flourishes or that we have funds to do certain things, but it's about us reminding ourselves, everything I have comes from God. It's about us teaching our children that we might have a nice house and a warm place to sleep and a nice automobile, even a four-wheeler and a fishing pole and maybe a shotgun and rifle. All those things is because God has blessed us. And when you live for God, he will not send you out empty. And that 
Therefore, we cannot come into his presence empty. And so we bring our offerings and we bring our gifts to him. And I challenge you in these 52 weeks, if you'll listen to the voice of God, and every week go to God and ask him, Lord, this gift part right here, I've already paid my tithes and I've given some offerings and I've helped some missionaries, but this gift right here for 52 weeks, Lord, reminding me and my friends and my family and my children about giving and how that God has given us everything and you've never sent us empty but you've blessed us over and over and you've taught us and showed us how that we can make money and how we can have things that we need and Lord now what would you have me do this week what would you have me do this week and you check it off and you put it in this envelope because God's not sent me out empty. I may not have a whole lot to give, but I've got something to give. I've got more junk in my house if I could find a junk dealer to come and get it. God's not sent me out empty, so I can't come to his house empty. I can't come and stand and feel his presence and worship him and not bring something because he's blessed me. So I give. And then I encourage. <clears throat> the encourage is the brothers around me and the sisters around me who walk with God and are kind of like me in the same boat. They need a voice of encouragement. Do you realize how many negative voices there are? Our whole system of life is built on negativity. Every once in a while... We'll stumble on at some occasion where we, we focus more on positive than negatives. But a whole lot of times, it's the negative stuff that, that we focus on. Raising our children. We spend more time telling them what not to do than we do for praising them for what they do right. We call them job evaluations, and they're supposed to tell us about the things we do well, but most of the time, the focus is on what we're not getting right. Do you call them go lights or do you call them stop lights? They're stop lights. How many of you this week, outside of church, outside of people in the church, how many of you this week received a compliment or a word of encouragement from somebody who's not in this church? Raise your hands high. Good. How many of you didn't? Don't be bashful. Yeah. Most of the time, encouragement is sadly lacking in our world. And especially in the church. We take each other for granted. But we don't know the stories. And we don't know what people are dealing with. So many things. I almost went down that road, and I'm, I'm not going. But we got to encourage people. Once a week, find somebody in the church and just encourage them. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the life you live. Thank you for being an example that my children can follow. Thank you for helping my kids do this. Thank you for helping and loving my family. Find a way. And then the next one, invite. We're called to reach others. We make these little cards, the invite cards. They fit right down in here real nice and neat. So you can put them in there. You can put a couple other notes. A little index card fits real neatly in there so that you can write down the name of the person you want to encourage. Or even while you're sitting here this morning, you can jot down on the back of this envelope people that you need to comment on. Leanna sang really well Sunday. I admire her worship. She needs to hear that from somebody besides her mama. Preacher preached real good today. His mama has no clue. So, But you can write those things down here. Put a little index card in there. When you get down to dis disciple and invite, who are you going to invite? Write their name down. 
Who are you going to disciple? Which one of these young children, young people around here are you, are you going to encourage? Brother David Beecham does something I think is kind of neat. At his church, he tries to identify something in the lives of the 8 to 10-year-olds. And he's got one boy who's really interested in missions. And Brother David doesn't call him by his name. He calls him missionary. And he says he's, he's letting the boy know you can become a missionary if that's what you want. What about some of the kids around us? Missionary. So those seven things, those seven things. And I'm almost finished this morning. But I've told you some things that we're, uni we're united for. We're united for praying. We're united for reading. And we're united for fasting. We're united for giving. We're united for encouraging and united for inviting. And we're united for discipling. But we're also united against some things. I've got four things that as a church we need to stand united against. The first one is we need to stand united against fear. We need to stand united against fear. I think one of the greatest powers that's working in the world, in our culture today, is that of fear. And I'm not attempting here today to try to be a psychologist or a medical doctor and determine whether it's, it's somebody's chemicals out of balance or there's some, some health issues that are caused. I'm, I'm not messing with that. But I am telling you that if we will stand united against fear, even those in our congregation who suffer from medical or chemical issues that cause them to have struggles with that, they can find help and they can find strength and they can find family and they can find hope and they can find peace in the presence of God here. And I also believe that if there are times where this world and its future or even Satan tries to dump his load on top of us of fear and doubt about what's ahead of us, when he tries to make us fearful that our children are going to survive and they cannot thrive, when we're worried about the health of our family and our, our adults and we, we look around this world and it seems so unfriendly and fear comes into the hearts of moms and dads and children, I'm convinced that if we will raise up a standard of faith and strength that God will help us push that fear out of our hearts and out of our lives. Folks, we need to stand united against fear. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Though the hosts camp against me, in this will I be confident. And I'm messing it up, but you know what it says. We've got to trust God. We've got to let faith push fear out of our lives. So when you face fear, when you face fear, if you can control your, your focus, begin to pray for other people. Pray for folks that you know also struggle with fear. And it helps sometimes to stand up and walk around. And it helps to get this strong back and stand. And I know sometimes fear can be overwhelming. And sometimes it's difficult even to move. But I'm telling you, if you will force yourself and take some steps, I'm confident that if there is a problem that's related to spiritual warfare, if there is a problem that's related to our own natural fears, that there will be strength that comes from God as you pray and as you speak. And if the devil's going to use fear against you, turn it back around and use it against him by praying not just for yourself, but for others that you know who deal with fear. God is our strength and our hope. And we will worship and we will praise and we will gather together and we will unite together till our last breath. We're going to stand united against fear and we're going to lift high the banner of faith. We're going to be united against hate. Love cannot flourish if we allow ourselves to hate. Selective hating is still hating. Loving 80% of the world and hating 20% is still motivated by hate. God is love. We don't have to agree with people to love people. 
We don't have to take stands and stand strong and firm against things in a nasty, hateful way. So as a church, we must be united against hate. Not belligerent to people, not waving signs in their faces and declaring them idiots and stupid. If you cannot debate something with folks without making it a personal slander against them, you need to keep your mouth shut. Any argument or debate that winds up being, you're stupid, you don't understand, you're a dummy, you're an idiot, has already gotten to a point that there's no discussion of the real issue. And that should never describe us. Again, if your argument cannot be conducted with facts and with truth, then you really ought to just walk away. Because even if I win the argument, if I just play hate or unkindness, I've lost. Because I don't represent me, and I really don't necessarily represent this church, although I do. I represent the one I say I belong to. The one I say who died but now lives in me. The one I say that I'm crucified, and as we read in the book of Romans, the one I say I'm buried and live again in, that's the one I represent. And he stood against sin, and he ran the money changers out of the temple and he talked about hypocrites and he confronted them, but he didn't hate. He didn't hate. We've got to stand united against hate. And the people that you don't like and the people that you can't stand, you need to look behind them and through them and see the conflict and the problem or maybe where they came from or what they deal with. Sometimes we... I can't. I don't have time. We've got to be united against hate. Boy, there's a lot I want to say. We've got to be united against hoarding. Everybody say hoarding. What's the opposite of hoarding? And what are we called to do? We're called to give. The stuff that God's given us and the blessings God's dumped on us is not for us to enjoy and burn up and use. It's for us to use to show the love of God. So yeah, buy you another four-wheeler. Just take all your neighbors a ride on it. And yeah, get you a bigger house. Just invite more people over and have Bible studies there. Because what God has called us to do is share his love, not hoard his blessings. Love is revealed in giving. And the things we hoard are wasted. We've got to share our gospel. We've got to share our joy. We've got to share our stuff. So have a big yard sale. Then have a big fish fry for the neighborhood and use the money to... Folks, we just got to realize the more that belongs to us, the more this world becomes our home. And the more we become attached to the stuff that we have, the less we can be attached to the things of God. We've got to stand united against hoarding the blessings of God. And then finally, we've got to stand united against pride. We've got to stand united against pride. There is a culture that's unique to the apostolic church. The way we dress, the way we live, our mannerisms, our words, there's a culture. Some of it I know perhaps is not good, but the majority of it is really essential if you're going to live out what the Bible says. And sometimes we develop, and it's not an intentional action, and that's why I'm mentioning it today. We don't become prideful on purpose. It's just sometimes if we're not careful, we've lived this way so long that we look at other people who aren't as if they're choosing to be dominated by something other than a love for God or not with the understanding that they didn't have the opportunities that we've had. And perhaps had they been given the opportunity and knowledge that we have, they may have far exceeded us in living for God. And so we've got to stand against pride. That's one of the reasons we can't hoard and that's why we can't hate and that's why we can't fear is because... We can't let pride 
dominate us. We've got to stand united against pride. Folks, we've got one of the best praise and worship groups around, but praise and worship groups won't get you to heaven. It's the Word of God, and it's following our faith as He opens our faith and understanding to His Word. It's, and, and so whether they can sing a lick or not, we've got to love God's Word. And so we can't take pride in what we can offer and the beauty of the song. We've got to realize we've got to be God's servant and love God. We may have a wonderful 100-year tradition here, but 100 years of habit is simply 100 years of habit. You just show up every Sunday and do the same thing for 100 years, there's got to be a real fire in us. There's got to be the truth in us. There's got to be a faith in us. And, and it can't be motivated by pride. So as a church, we've got to stand united against fear, against hate, against hoarding, and against pride. Would you stand with me this morning? One of these days, I will learn how to make a 15-minute sermon not last 40 But when I ponder our world and I realize how desperately it needs what you have, and then when I consider how much we, like that early church, are stumbling through life trying to reconcile in our mind the power of God that we see displayed with all the stuff that we can't explain on the other hand, It brings me back right here to want to keep telling you over and over and over. God's worked in your life. God's moved in your soul. You've seen it. You've felt it. You've experienced it. You know His Word is true. Let's stay united together in His Word. Let's build upon it. Let's build strong walls for ourselves, for our families. Let's not let down and allow the world around us to start telling us who we are. Let's not let them decide what normal will look like. Let's not let them tell us what success is. But instead, let's go back to this book and let's look at it again. And it may mean when I look at it that I don't have as much money because I don't pursue that as much as I did. And, and I may not have as much time for certain events and that may... But it's not about pride or hate, but it's all about trying to find in this book the direction that God has for me because he's promised he won't send me out empty and I'll always have plenty to bring back. And my children have got to know and my neighbors have got to know. But unless somebody builds the wall, unless somebody shows them about reading and praying and fasting and giving and discipling, inviting and encouraging, unless they learn about, as in our holy, about the life that Jesus came to give and the hope that he brings and the peace that he wants them to have, somebody's got to do that, and that's why we're building these walls. And so this morning, I'm going to invite you to take that little envelope you've got, and if you've committed one this week, perhaps if you don't put an offering in there, you... You may not want to put your name on it. That's fine. But I'm asking you every Sunday, every Sunday, bring one of these envelopes. Because at the end of this, in 52 weeks, now down to about 49 weeks or so, I'd like to see how many of these we've collected. Because each one of them, each check mark represents an hour of prayer. Each check represents a verse of scripture. It represents a day of fasting. All of these things, a child that's encouraged and discipled, an elder that's thanked, all of these represent more than just a check mark on a page, but they represent a, a deliberate act that somebody in this church made to build a wall so that the world can see there is a gospel that changes life and that is life everlasting. So I encourage you as they sing, join me around the front as we finish this morning. If you have a need or something in your life that you'd like to take before the Lord, if there's sins you haven't repented of, if, if you need the Holy Ghost, you can receive all that as well. But let's renew our commitment to build this wall. Would you join me this morning and bring your commitment to the front and lay it here in Jesus' name. My praise waits for you. Stand around.
around the front for a little bit. Even if you don't have an envelope to bring, if you'd like to join us, let's give the Lord thanks. He's not, he's not brought us out empty. He's not brought us out empty. Let's give him praise this morning. In Jesus' name. My praise, my praise.